As you can see from this slide, my name is Alexey Larionov, and I am a lecturer in bioinformatics in Cranfield University in the UK. Uh, in this seminar, we will start with a recap of the standard regression framework that could be used for both common or rare variants. Then we will look at why rare variants may need special treatment. Then we will discuss the main methods for rare variance aggregation, including burden and variance component tests, weighting and permutation tests for association assessment of significance. And uh, to illustrate this discussion, I will use examples showing how these methods are used in SCAT R package. In this seminar, I cannot avoid using some mathematical formulas on statistical terms. However, my main focus will be on explaining the intuition behind the methods rather than going deep into mathematics or statistics. So this classical figure from the review written more than 10 years ago, yeah, uh, still perfectly illustrates what we mean by rare and common variants in cancer research. Conventionally, Variants with minor allele frequency below 1% are considered to be rare. Sometimes the cutoff may go down to 0.1%. And you can see that historically, the rare variants were discovered by co-segregation in cancer families. In contrast, the association methods were initially developed for common variants often measured by microarrays at the time. Of course, most of rare variants were not present on microarrays. However, recent expansion of whole exome and whole genome sequencing in large populations started to provide data that allow applying association analysis to rare variants too. And this is why we discuss this in our seminar. Well, the Easiest way of assessing association in cancer research is to use crude counts and contingency tables. In cancer studies, the outcome is often presented as a categorical binary variable, such as cancer cases and healthy controls. So the association can be evaluated just by using Fisher test in two by two table. When applicable, Fisher test is still widely used because of its simplicity and straightforward interpretation. It reports both the significance and the effect size. Uh, another type of uh, contingency table that used to be popular in genetic analysis includes trend tests like Cochrane-Armitage test. However, uh, it's hardly used now because it is considered to be clearly inferior to the regression framework, which we will discuss on the next slide. Two main limitations of the contingency tables are that they only work with categorical outcomes and they don't allow to account for covariates. These limitations could be resolved by using regression methods. First of all, Regression methods allow for both binary and quantitative phenotypes. This slide shows linear regression, which can be used for quantitative phenotypes. Uh, for instance, you may look at the genetic predisposition to breast density on mammogram. As usual in any regression model, the coefficient beta in front of the genotype is the measure of association. Like with the Fisher test, it provides information on both significance and effect size of association. Importantly, the regression framework also allows for easy incorporation of different inheritance models just through different coding of genotypes. Most commonly, we use so-called additive model when genotype is simply coded as 0, 1, or 2, representing homozygous reference, heterozygous, or homozygous alternative genotype. 
for dominant inheritance, heterozygous or homozygous alternative genotypes have the same biological effect. So we may code both of them as one. And uh, in a similar way, we can code for recessive inheritance. As I mentioned, the regression framework also allows for binary phenotypes. It can be done by using logistic regression. For binary phenotypes, logistic regression estimates the probability of an outcome. For instance, the probability of cancer. Mathematically, this happens by adding a special link function called logit. If P is a probability of outcome, then logit is log of odds. This function has two very useful properties. First, its range of values spans from minus infinity to plus infinity, which allows using it with a linear regression model. And second, it's easy to convert the logit back to probability. So in this hypothetical example, if we have genotype zero, which is homozygous reference, the logit value will be minus four, which can be translated to a very low probability of cancer. Again, in this two example, if we had the genotype two, which is homozygous alternative, the probability of cancer would be high. Importantly, this beta coefficient in logistic regression still can be used as the measure of association for both significance and effect size. And very conveniently, the effect size could be calculated as odd ratio and even confidence interval of the odds ratio, just taking the exponent of beta coefficient. The other important property of the regression framework, as I already mentioned, is its ability to include covariates. So why do we need these covariates? Imagine that we study genetic risk of breast cancer. And in our case control study, the cases are on average slightly older than controls. Age is a known risk factor for breast cancer. So some cancers in cases would just happen because of age, having nothing to do with any genetics. Mathematically, adding age as a covariate uh, allows to resolve and take uh, sort of care of these imbalances between cases and controls. In, um, in practice, these regression coefficients for covariates are usually calculated just once and then are fixed. Uh, and they are calculated before adding any, any genotypes to the model. After those fixed coefficients are added and calculated in the model, then we calculate beta as a random variable. That is including mean, variance, and its significance. Again, for simplicity, I often will show uh, examples with linear regression. But everything that I'm saying usually is directly applicable for logit regression too. An important point when we are talking about covariates is that there are two types of covariates. In addition to the covariates with uh, easy, uh, meaningful interpretation, such as sex and age, we often add the other type of covariates, the top principal components. Sometimes this is PC1 and PC2. Sometimes the principal components are called eigenvectors. It's a special sort of covariates, and they reflect the ethnicity of participants. They are included not because the ethnicity is supposed to do something with phenotype or with probability of cancer. They are included because ethnic genetic differences are extremely strong. So even the slightest difference in ethnicity between cases and controls will immediately lead to many variants being different between cases and controls. However, these variants will have nothing to do with cancer or other studied phenotypes. They would only reflect the hidden ethnic differences, sometimes called population stratification. 
And an elegant way of dealing with this problem is just to include the top principal components into the model. You may ask, why on earth the top principal components would reflect the ethnicity? Uh, well, the logic uh, is simple. Mathematically, top principal components are designed to capture most of the genetic variation. Currently, it happened that ethnicity is the strongest source of genetic differences between people. It was even empirically shown that top principal components can mirror geographical maps, like in this paper and in this picture. And to be honest, it doesn't surprise me that in genetic space, Spanish are very similar to Portuguese and British are very different from Italians. It could be that in a thousand years, all races and ethnic groups and all will mix and something else will become the main source of our genetic differences. But for now, top principal components can be easily used to reflect the ethnicity. The question is uh, in practical uh, analysis, how many top principal components to include? And there is no common rule about it. Typically, I would say it's somewhere between three and 10 principal components. However, many people may argue with this my statement because it's subjective and depends on the data. Usually, uh, I select number of principal components based on the script plots and PCA plots. On one hand, uh, we want to exclude the hidden ethnic differences between cases and controls. On the other hand, it was shown that including too many principal components may introduce noise or even reduce the true genetic signal. Uh, so I include uh, <clears throat> the principal components that are clearly different from the other components on the screen plot because they explain much, explain much higher proportion of variation. And also, I want to see more or less homogeneous PCA plot after exclusion the top principal components. And you can see that on the space of principal component three and principal component four, the dots, cases and controls are distributed more or less homogeneously. And here the top two principal components are clearly different from the others in terms of the proportion of captured genetic variation. So in these specific examples, I would include only two principal components into the model. I should admit that typically I would expect more than two principal components in the model. Uh, this slide uh, concludes this quick recap of the regression framework that could be used for both common and rare variants. So before going to the next part of the seminar that is specific for rare variants, I just want to add a small remark about the notation that I use in my slides. I use this semi-formal notation because I think that it's more intuitive for people with biomedical background. Of course, you won't see this notation very often in, uh, I don't know, pay, scientific papers. In papers, people tend to use uh, strict mathematical notations, often written in vectorized form, like this one. I would like to assure you that uh, my intuitive way of writing equations is fully equivalent to what I mean by the vectorized forms. And here I even color coded which parts of my intuitive equations corresponds to which part of the strict vectorized form. Okay, if the association methods are so well developed for common variants, why can't we use them directly to the rare ones? Well, strictly speaking, we can. But the problem is that rare variants are rare. This dramatically reduces the power of studies. I illustrated here by a Fisher test example. However, the story is exactly the same in regression. In the common variant uh, case, if we have 
true differences between cases and controls where allelic frequencies increases from 0.40% to 60%, just 100 cases and 100 controls is sufficient to detect this difference. For rare variants, when the true allelic frequencies for certain variant changes from 0.4% to 0.6%, even 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls is not sufficient to detect this association. By the way, this slide also illustrates one technical parameter important for rare variant analysis. It's minor allele count. Here, it's only 10 for plus six. Uh, from my experience, it's extremely unlikely to detect any significance if minor allele count is less than 20. So what can we do with this problem of insufficient power in rare variants? There are two solutions. And the first solution is brute force. Just run very large studies when you need very large numbers. For instance, this is a rare variant analysis that was done on a cohort of 70,000 participants. However, this brute force solution only works for the phenotypes, which can be evaluated in virtually each participant, like, I don't know, blood pressure, weight, or uh, height. Cancer, oh, well, luckily, is not so common trait. And if we want to study some specific subtype of cancer, then we may quickly run out of power in even in the very large populations. For instance, I was recently involved in a study of heritable predisposition to um, contralateral breast cancer. Uh, the breast cancer may happen only in women, which is 50% of population. It happens in about 10% of all women. And contralateral asynchronous breast cancer is developing, let's say, in about 10% of all breast cancers. So if we have the source population of 100,000 people, we may have only 500 cases. So for many Mm, studies, brute force is not yet an answer for rare variant association analysis. An alternative approach is to aggregate multiple variants and take the information from several variants, analyzing them together. A natural unit of aggregation, of course, would be a G. However, we can also aggregate per pathway, including several genes, per right, gene panel, per sliding window over, G, or, over the genome, per haplotype group, whatever mark makes biological sense for a specific question. In addition to the biological sense, aggregation also makes a statistical sense because it increases the power and minor, minor allele count and it decreases the number of tests. In the remaining part of the seminar, we will only discuss the approaches to aggregation of rare variants. And the good thing is that we can use the same regression framework as we used for single variant and discussed before. You already can recognize these covariates. Also, uh, well, however, the change is about this part of the equation. For single variant, we looked at beta coefficient and genotype. In most general form for the association, uh, aggregation association analysis, it changes to some function that somehow aggregates the genotypes from multiple variants. And uh, a number of different functions were suggested so far for this, but the most commonly used function is actually linear function. And the linear function uh, is used not only because of its mathematical simplicity, it is also because of its clear biological assumptions. The effects of aggregated variants should be independent and additive. Uh, again, uh, also I use this non-formal notation, which I hope helps to understand the intuition behind the methods. Those who prefer vectorized notation can easily see that linear aggregation 
of variance is very similar to the single variant analysis, except that we provide a vector of beta coefficients instead of a single beta coefficient and the matrix of genotypes instead of the vector of genotypes for single variant analysis. A very commonly used variant of the linear model is weighted linear model, which is based on the same assumptions as simple linear model, but also recognizes that not all ray variants are created equal. It allows to assign different weights for different variants. For instance, putting more weight to a ray stop gains than to a common synonymous SNPs, recognizing the fact that the ray stop gain is more likely to cause some changes in protein function and in the studied phenotype. Uh, the linear weighted uh, <coughs> kernel and the linear weighted model is used in SCAT R package by default. Uh, SCAT also implements some other functions that are based on different kernels. And this is why it's called sequence kernel associated test, association test. However, the biological assumptions uh, behind the other kernels are not as clear as we discussed for the linear weighted kernel. For instance, uh, it is believed that these quadratic or two-way uh, kernels might capture some epistatic effects rather than assumption that all variants are independent. I'm not sure so how often, often can we observe interactions in ray variants. Anyway, because other kernels are used extremely rare in the rest of the seminar, when I refer to SCAT functions, I will always assume that we use the default, the default linear weighted kernel. As you may remember from the initial introduction to the regression framework, framework the coefficients for covariates are usually estimated once before adding information about genotype. In SCAT package, it's done by SCAT null function. For this function, we only need to provide phenotypes and matrix of covariates. We don't need to provide genotype yet. This function will determine an object that I call here null model. And this whole object is provided to the next as an argument to the next function that is actually performing the association test. Of course, this next function will require providing the matrix of phenotypes. Uh, SCAT allows to calculate association tests for both continuous and binary outcomes. For continuous outcome, the new model should be calculated using this output type C for continuous. For binary outcome, this output type, when you calculate new model, should be set to D. Somehow it's for dichotomous outcome. Dichotomous is the same, another way of saying binary. And then when we calculate the significance, for continuous outcomes or continuous phenotypes, we should use function SCAT. And for logistic regression, we just use function SCAT binary. Now, let's see how SCAT package estimates the beta coefficients for these multiple variants. Well, in fact, it doesn't estimate the beta coefficient for each variant. Instead, it performs a single test for a null hypothesis that all of those coefficients are equal to zero. And conceptually, such testing could be split in three steps. First, we need somehow estimate the effect of each variant. Then we add the effects of all variants to each other. And finally, to calculate this score statistic. And finally, we look how likely such sum of effects or score statistic could happen under null hypothesis. Overall, it's a pretty standard statistical procedure. And this figure on the right uh, is uh, to illustrate the intuition behind it. Each variant here is shown as a lollipop 
x-axis is just to show, let's say, position in the gene, but it's irrelevant for analysis here, this exact position. And then y-axis shows the effect of each variant. Assume that some of the variants in the area of aggregation have no true association with phenotype. And we show this sort of variants in black here. In our specific data sets, we don't expect the effect size being high, and it could be randomly positive or negative, and overall we expect that they compensate for each other. However, if there are some variants that are truly associated with the disease, as shown here in red, we expect that their effect should be stronger, and we see that those lollipops are one, and they will not be compensated by sort of random opposite effect uh, variants. Uh, this will make the score statistic high and less likely to be present in the distribution under new hypothesis. In essence, this is how the burden test works. I will add just some minor comments uh, to this procedure. First, also this way of estimating the effect of individual variant is commonly used. I personally would prefer seeing a standard covariance here. It doesn't make difference for rare variants because this uh, mean uh, genotype for rare variants uh, is very close to zero. But generally, I would prefer to hear to see this difference between genotype and mean genotype instead of just genotype here. But it's inconsequential for analysis of rare variants and it's widely used so uh, for compatibility with previous studies, of course, I am using it how it is implemented in the packages. Uh, second, please pay attention here that there are two ways of estimating the distribution of score statistics under the null. It could be either analytically approximated by key square with uh, one degree of freedom, or it could be directly assessed by permutations. If possible, the permutation approach is always better because the assumptions underlying this key square approximation may not be correct for rare variants. These were two technical comments, and my third comment will be more conceptual. What if the same gene may contain variants with opposite directional effect? In this case, we cannot use burden tests because the effects of protective and risk variants would compensate, would compensate each other. If such biological hypothesis is viable, then we need to use a different type of tests, sometimes called variant component tests. Mathematically, the only difference is that when calculating this score statistic, we <coughs> square the weighted effects before adding them. In contrast to what we were doing in burden tests, where first we were adding and then squaring them. Uh, this variant component tests, also they allow to detect, uh, to, to aggregate variants with opposite direction of effect are slightly less sensitive when in fact, we have only uh, variants that have the same direction of effect. So aggregating, for instance, variants in DNA repair genes in cancer studies, I would prefer using burden test because it's hard for me to imagine a variant in BRCA1 gene which could protect against breast cancer. Maybe in some studies, when we study, I don't know, receptors and cholesterol level, there could be some variants in this, I don't know, cholesterol receptors of transporters that may increase or decrease chances of developing atherosclerosis. For cancer studies, I usually prefer using um, burden tests. SCAT package allows calculating both burden and various component tests. The type of test is specified by this method argument. And for burden tests, the method is called burden. 
For variant component tests, the method is very modestly called just SCAT. <laughs> Actually, it makes sometimes leads to some confusions because when we chat in the lab between each other, we say, how did you calculate this test? Oh, using SCAT. And it is not immediately transparent. Is it burden SCAT or SCAT SCAT? So pay attention that this may have some sort of uh, semantic uh, complications. Also, there is an interesting thought option in uh, SCAT library where the score statistic attempts to pick an optional combination of both burden and SCAT tests. It uses this parameter row, and depending on this parameter row, it includes different proportion of one or the other statistics. Of course, when row is zero, then score statistic is identical to the SCAT test. And when row is one, then the score statistic is identical to the burden test. Uh, also, it could be tempting to use SCAT O, how this method is called. Uh, in all the cases, I personally don't like using it because it blurs the initial assumptions and the biological interpretation of uh, the result. Uh, and of course, the same options that we were discussing for uh, SCAT binary uh, that I'm showing here for SCAT function are also applicable to SCAT binary function if we do the logistic regression. Uh, I wanted to note here in this slide that in this seminar, I illustrate the rare variance analysis using SCAT package. I do it because it implements all the methods that I need, and I know this package because I use it a lot in my work. However, there are many other software tools that implement conceptually similar tests. This table from a very good review by Lee with co-authors tries to classify different tests and software tools for rare variant analysis. Uh, I don't expect you to read all this table right now. Uh, it's here to illustrate that there is much more software than SCAT for rare variant analysis. And at the same time, this table shows that conceptually, most of the tests can be sort of classified or split to burden-like tests, that deal with variants of the same direction of effect and sort of variant component type of tests that uh, allow for the variance with opposite direction of effects or some combination of these methods. Uh, for instance, when we illustrate some other approaches that are not implemented in SCAT, uh, we can consider some so-called adaptive burden tests. They allow for opposite direction on effects by simply changing the sign of effect for protective variants and then applying the standard uh, methods similar to burden tests. Then uh, some uh, of the tests may uh, select only variants with the strongest effect. Uh, in this example, it is also this specific uh, method by Hoffman. It also allows to include the opposite directions of effect by adding this sort of uh, adaptive weighting. However, independently of the technicalities, SCAT or other implementation, uh, if I had to select the main message from this seminar, then this message would be like this. Most of the available approaches for variant aggregation could be split into either burden-like tests or tests that allow opposite directions of effect or their combination. Another uh, part of rare variant analysis that I mentioned previously before, another choice that we need to make when we actually apply this analysis is the choice of weighting of variants. Uh, you remember how these weights are conceptually included in this linear weighted model. This reminds you how these weights are included in calculating score statistics in, let's say, uh, SCAT implementation. And we can consider um, several ways of weighting variants. The most common uh, way of weighting variants is weighting by allelic frequency. Uh, 
Uh, maybe I consider this most common because it's included in, the, in SCAT by default. And the idea is, the assumption is that common variants are less likely to be pathogenic. Well, this assumption is very reasonable for oncology. So usually I do apply this default SCAT weighting. In some uh, papers, term weighting may also refer to filtering by pathogenicity or to changing the sign of effect according to the direction of effect. As we mentioned previously, this adaptive weighting. As I said, SCAT package applies weight by... Uh, applies weight when it calculates uh, score statistics and significance. And it uses two parameters in the SCAT function that could, uh, could set the weight for the analysis. By default, uh, the weighting is following the function that is described by weights beta 125. Uh, with these parameters 1 and 25, it's shown here on the plot in red. And you can see that weight of the variants that are more than 20% of minor early frequency is virtually zero. And then weights significantly increase when we have the rare variants. It's possible to adjust these coefficients. For instance, when you put coefficients 0.5 and 0.5, it will be equivalent to the popular Madsen Browning weight. You can read more about this weight in this paper. And this shown is this weighting equation is shown in blue. And you can see also it's much steeper when uh, it comes to the rare variants. At the same time, it doesn't go to zero for common variants. So it somehow incorporates the common variant effects too, also with much less weight. The other parameter, not weights beta, but weights, uh, allows uh, any user defining weighting of the user defined weighting of the variants, and it overrides the parameter weights beta. Also, SCAT can switch from one, one weight function to another. This is implemented in a so-called SCAT common rare function, function. Thus, you can use a standard default weight for rare variants and switch to the Mads and Browning weight for common variants, because this Mads and Browning weight have non-zero weights for these common variants. Of course, all these parameters and the functions can be um, tuned by the user. As I mentioned, uh, some papers consider filtering as a sort of weighting, where non-pathogenic variants are just given zero weights. Also, I don't like calling uh, filtering waiting for not to mix it up with the default SCAT weights. Filtering itself, it's still a very relevant step for the rare variant analysis. There are many criteria that can be used to evaluate pathogenicity of variants, and I'm not going to discuss them here. It's a separate large area of research. Just to illustrate here, I'm showing what filtering I applied in one uh, recent study where I looked for heritable predisposition for contralateral breast cancer. First of all, I only included variants in a specific gene panel. Then of them, I only included either known pathogenic variants in clean war, or predicted loss of function variants, or even some missing variants that were um, highly to affect the protein function by consensus of several scores. Of course, I excluded variants that are known benign in clean work. For instance, I remember there is one more or less common stop gain in bracket two that is known benign. And here I also excluded any common variant with a little, fra uh, a little uh, frequency more than 0.1. Of course, this filtering is specific for study that you are doing. And uh, the last point that I wanted to discuss in this seminar is how to apply the permutation style significance testing in SCAT package. As we discussed uh, earlier, to get p-value from the score statistics, 
we need to know we need to know its distribution under the null hypothesis. Under some assumptions, the distribution of the score statistics can be approximated by key square distribution. However, these assumptions are not always true for area variance. So the alternative approach is to estimate distribution of the core statistic, score statistics under the null using phenotype permutations. SCAT allows permutation style testing and calls it, and calls it efficient resampling. However, it is not used by default because of its computationally because, because it is computationally demanding. To use the efficient resampling test, you need to set the number of permutations or resampling number in terms of SCAT when you build the SCAT null model. And then you need to explicitly require ER efficient resampling method in the parameter method.binary. And pay attention that there are two different uh, uh, parameters with similar names, parameter method that allows to select between, let's say, burden and SCAT aggregation, and the separate parameter method binary that allows to call for permutation style um, testing. And that's nearly it. Uh, in this slide, I just illustrate how I put everything together and how I used SCAT in that recent study, which I mentioned a couple of times uh, as an example during this presentation. You can see that in building of null model, I am requiring binary outcome, and I am setting the parameter for efficient resampling. In the matrix of covariates, I include the covariates relevant uh, to my study. And as I shown in slide 10, in this case, I used only two top principal components. It's also interesting not only what I include into the matrix of covariates, but also what I don't include. For instance, after some discussion within group, we decided not to include familial history as a covariate because it can be actually directly caused familial history by the very variants that we are going to study. If we included familial history, in this case, it could flatten the effect of those variants. Then when I calculated actually statistical significance, first I used SCAT binary function for logistic regression. Then I selected burden style of aggregation. As I said, I like it. Again, I set the parameter to use efficient resampling. For the genotypes matrix, I used the uh, additively coded array coding variants in, uh, that are likely affecting the protein function, as I explained in one or two slides before. And by default, I used linear, Werner, linear weighted kernel and uh, beta 125. This is the default weight in SCAT weighting by allelic frequency. And after this, I can extract the results from the object returned by SCAT, SCAT binary mm, function. Uh, there are many uh, things that you can extract from uh, this uh, object. Usually I extract two things, p-value and minor allele count. And now the very last slide of the presentation is how do I report the result? Uh, unfortunately, some uh, of the aggregation tests do not provide a convenient measure of effect size. So uh, you cannot provide effect size for variance um, uh, component aggregation. And for this uh, type of uh, tests, I only uh, report p-value. And usually, I like to report minor level count. But I'm clearly stating which test I'm using from what software? Uh, well, in this case, because it was burden test, I also found the geneticists, mm, they want to see some indication of effect size. And they want to see something that they got used to when they were doing single variant analysis. So I am reporting aggregated allele frequency from crude counts, and I am reporting odds ratio from crude counts. <clears throat> 
However, I clearly state that this is only additional information from crude counts. And this does not account for any population stratification or other covariates. If suddenly the tendencies that you can see in crude counts uh, do not agree with whatever we can see in proper uh, aggregation test, then it's a reason for reflection on the results. In this example, everything was uh, consistent and uh, we concluded in that study that uh, ray variance in the studied um, gene panel are associated with the risk of contralateral breast cancer. So uh, I think that in this seminar, we've briefly looked and recapped the general regression uh, framework that is used for association analysis. We discussed uh, burden and variance component tests for a variant aggregation. We discussed different types of weighting and uh, we illustrated how to use our SCAT package to perform all these tasks. Uh, now it's time for questions, but I think that Ajay, can you? Yeah, I'll, I'll read out the question and then. Yes, can. please. The first question is, uh, what is the definition of a link function? When using a link function in the model, can we interpret the results in the same way as we don't use link functions? Uh, to be honest, that's a question. One second, I will go to the slide. Uh, that's a question not to ray variant analysis, but a question about Lagit regression in general. So I will just explain again what is the link function and why we need the link function. When we use just standard linear regression, the range of outcomes is from minus infinity to plus infinity. It's a line. So it's hard to interpret when we have a binary outcome, yes or no. So the link function is just uh, the function that we put on the left side of the equation instead of the outcome itself. There are different types of link functions. This specific Lagit link function is designed and very convenient to use for binary outcomes. It allows to interpret first to fit the linear model to the Lagit uh, range of values from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then if we want to interpret it as probability, usually when we use it for ray variant analysis, we don't interpret, uh, we, we don't think about how it's done mathematically. The main thing that we are looking at is beta coefficient. So interpretation of beta coefficient when we use link function or, or Lagit link function is two ways. First, we use its p-value as we would normally use p-value for beta coefficient. And second, we can extract odds ratio from beta coefficient because beta coefficient uh, with Lagit function uh, is log of odds ratio. And we can use this information to extract it. Uh, what? I think this is how you can interpret this. If you need more information, uh, read about Lagit regression. It's a generic, general statistical topic, not specific only for ray variance analysis. All right, so next question is about, uh, what about multiple test correction? If efficient resampling used, it's still necessary to perform multiple test correction. Uh, yes, yes, of course. Multiple, I haven't discussed here multiple testing correction. I will go to this efficient resampling bit. Yeah. Uh, the important point that uh, in, let's say, uh, this study that I discussed as an example, when we looked at aggregation of many variants in a single gene panel, we actually do just a single variant test, a single test. Because when we calculate this test, it's not for each individual variant. 
it's for a single uh, test that all of them are equal to zero. So you do not need to do multiple testing correction with regard to the number of variants that you aggregate. However, if we were doing it not for a single gene panel, but for 100 different gene panels, then of course we would need apply multiple testing correction according to the number of areas of aggregation. Uh, better example would be not with gene panels, but with uh, let's say uh, exome sequencing and uh, considering separately each gene, then you would need to correct for the number of genes. I think that I hope it's a pity we can't hear the reaction from people who ask questions. So I guess that I answered the question. Yeah. Um, the next question is about, I think, the practical materials. So some uh, Oscar is asking, is there any way to practice hands-on such as data and use the package mentioned in the in the presentation? Uh, there is detailed documentation about SCAT package, like any R, R package. Uh, it has a uh, reference, it has a uh, uh, manual, uh, it has, I remember at least half a dozen publication about it. Um, unfortunately, uh, it was designed, well, initially designed, it is being updated many years ago, so it was designed not for sequencing, but for microarray data. So it assumes having Plink data for analysis sometimes. In my examples, I only shown, uh, showed the basic functions that could be used for whatever matrices and vectors you have. Uh, so the short answer, yes, there is a large literature about SCAT package, but be prepared that it's not immediately as easy as I explain, as I try to explain here. When you read the papers, for instance, you will not have this intuition sort of uh, semi-formal equations. Be prepared to interpret some vectorized math. There is actually even inbuilt, some inbuilt data within SCAT package, I think. I never used it because I have my own data. Great. Uh, next question is, do we need to make to have similar ethnic diversity between control and cases groups? Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, as a general rule, if you include in your uh, genetic association study, uh, both Japanese, Europeans, or not even both, a mix of Japanese, Europeans, and Africans, I promise you a very hard time when you try to publish it. Uh, so ideally, in the very beginning, despite we add these principal components to correct for hidden ethnic uh, differences, ideally we should have as possible homogeneous ethnicity when we start the study. So principal components on my understanding, they are to correct for hidden differences. Because uh, when you look, I don't know, at uh, UK by bank, self-reported ethnicity, when you correct, uh, compare it to the actual gen genetic sort of data, is not always accurate. So it's inevitable that you will have some residual uh, heterogeneity and ethnicity. Uh, and it is corrected by principal components or eigenvectors, however you call it. But the more homogeneous uh, ethnically population you include in your study, the better. Okay, uh, next question is, is it possible to fit continuous response with non-normal distribution, for example, poison. My data are parasite counts per subject. First of all, in the context of a generalized uh, linear modeling, you can fit whatever you want to whatever you want. Of course, you can use the normal distributions. But when you use uh, already existing packages, such as SCAT, for instance, uh, they don't fit it like you would do with gene expression analysis when you use negative binomial, for instance. They use a very special type of test actually shown on this slide. And in that case, they estimate significance 
either by uh, assuming he's square or by permutations. So it's not, uh, first of all, you can fit whatever you want if you know how to work in general linear model, generalized linear model, but it's not directly relevant, I think, to the uh, variant aggregation and to the tests that we discussed. Okay. Um, can a rare variant have a protective effect on a phenotype? The variance component test can be used with just rare variants, or is it better to aggregate common variants too? Uh, uh, first of all, yes, of course, and it's a question not to statistician or by informatician, it's a question to clinician or biologist to decide whether it is relevant to consider biological assumption about opposite directions of effect. We were discussing it many times in our group when we were analyzing, let's say, predisposition to breast cancer and uh, where we consider it uh, variants within a panel of genes that are relevant to DNA repair, and we decided that chances of finding, finding any protective variant in DNA repair gene like BRCA1 against breast cancer is very low. But I'm absolutely sure that there could be biological questions when it is possible and even known that the same gene may have both directions of effect. For this, you use variance component tests. Uh, and again, you don't have to use only rare variants. Uh, as uh, you remember, uh, let me find it. Uh, even SCAT package have a special function that allows to combine rare and common variants. Yes, common variants are given very low weight, but they are still taken into account. They are not put to zero. I personally don't do it because in my area of interest, cancer predisposition, it's unlikely to have a, something common that confers risk to cancer, just under selection pressure. Right, uh, next question we have. Can I provide an external AF, such as uh, AF from NOM AD database? Uh, here, uh, when uh, SCAT by default applies weighting by allelic frequency, it takes allelic frequency from your data. So what was observed in your data? Using this option, not weights, weights beta, but just weights, you can calculate and provide whatever weights you want from whatever source. So yes, you can take your allelic frequencies from any source, then use any function that you like. You may use the same default cut functions and then put them here. Some uh, papers suggest using uh, weights that are based not on the whole popul studied population, like I don't know, cases and controls, but only use weights uh, based on the controls. So short answer, yes, you can use weights from many different sources, but more detailed answer, if you use default weights in SCAT, it will always take, always take weights from your data. Right, uh, next question is uh, how to deal with ethnic variant heterogeneity when assigning weights based on AF? Ah, weights based on allele frequency. I would say that uh, these are not, well, conceptually, for some variants, obviously, their allele frequencies depends on the ethnicity. But uh, when we correct for population stratification, adding principal components. Usually we don't use a small selected number of variants. We calculate principal components from at least, I don't know, 10,000 of common variants. So uh, there are different variants that we aggregate for our analysis. So uh, short answer is uh, correction for population stratification with principal components is not related to calculating weights based on allelic frequency. Uh, we can discuss some details, but even 
theoretically the connection is very distant. So these are two, uh, you, you shouldn't worry about uh, connection between uh, weights and ethnicity. All right. Uh, besides the significance of the association, does this cut also provide beta values for continuous traits? I think no, because uh, that's a problem. Uh, SCAT does not calculate individual beta values. SCAT calculates only the significance uh, based on this null hypothesis to have a single um, assumption that all of those betas are zero. So SCAT does not report uh, effect size. And this is why uh, some of my sort of uh, genetic colleagues were not happy. And they asked me to provide at least some estimate from aggregated crude counts. If you use burden tests, it makes sense. But if you use something like uh, variant component tests, then it could be a problem. Conceptually, there is no joint beta value for all variants. There is only significance of uh, against the null hypothesis that all of them are zero. Does not provide beta values, short answer. Not because it's lazy, but because it's conceptually impossible in this context in many cases. Next question is how important is it to filter the functional consequences of the variant? I always use it because I see biological sense in it, but generally it depends on the study that you are doing. In my context, when I am looking at the effect of rare, variant, rare protein affecting variants in DNA repair genes in terms of risk of developing cancer, then the very formulation of the task, rare protein affecting variants, requires for me to somehow estimate are they protein affecting or not. Obviously, it's not done automatically by SCAT because SCAT only applies weighting by allelic frequency. So I do it separately. It right. depends on the study. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. We perform exome wide association using SCAT. Any modifications to be considered? Uh, I did exome wide when I did aggregation of protein affecting variants per gene. The main obviously change was you need to apply multiple correction by the number of genes tested. Importantly, you don't apply multiple correction for the number of variants within each gene because it's single test per gene. But you do apply multiple correction for the number of genes. And remember, when you start doing this uh, exome wide, applying efficient resampling might be computationally demanding. Uh, SCAT is not very good in parallelizing. So you may need your script to parallelize it or wait overnight until it's calculated. Another thing that I can say when you use not uh, use a single test, but multiple tests, there is a very nice function that makes uh, QQ plot in a SCAT package when you have uh, sort of many tests, uh, but it's beyond this 45 minutes. Uh, so first, multiple tests and correction, and you apply it additionally yourself. Or if you use input like uh, Plink, in Plink format, SCAT may do it for you. And second, uh, be aware about very nice QQ plot uh, functionality, because it allows to correct QQ plots. If you don't correct QQ plots, uh, quite often in rare variants, you can see even deflation because it's hard to find significance with such a small number of variants. Correcting this deflation could be done using uh, minimal achievable P, how it's done in SCAT package. All right, uh, next question is, could we use different types of omics data with, within the SCAT package? Uh, because it was designed for ray variants, SCAT package itself, well, uh, it's not actually a, a simple question. Uh, if you think the historically, historically the kernel uh, based association was initially suggested for gene expression data. But then 
it's evolved to the package that is focused on the sequencing data. So uh, sometimes they even call it, if I can find it somewhere, uh, sequence kernel association test or SNP set uh, kernel association test. So this package is currently focused on a specific type of genomics data. But the concept of kernel uh, association uh, could be used widely. We didn't discuss kernels because obviously in 99% of cases, it's just linear weighted kernel, that's it. All right. Uh, next question we have is, can we use partial least square discriminant analysis, PLSDA, instead of PCA? For what purpose? To calculate in principal components, it's easy. Oh, I can vector. There is no point in it. If you use this uh, discrimination, linear discrimination analysis, it's for classification rather. I don't see immediately how can you use it. Uh, yes, you can use discrimination in principal component space for classification, but it's not relevant to anything what uh, generically not relevant. Of course, in some specific study, you may see connection, but to calculate principal components, just use uh, principal components. How to choose the variables to do the principal component analysis? Principal component analysis in this case is done using uh, at least uh, 10,000 common variants that are not in linkage uh, disequilibrium. Uh, it's like you read something maybe about print package or uh, try to, I don't know, Google papers about uh, principal components for ethnicity assessment. Uh, it's not how to choose variables and how to choose variants, I suppose. This normally should be at least, I don't know, 10,000 common variants, not only room, random 10 variants. Common, they are not as informative. Question is, since main purpose to use regression model is to explain effect of each variable, how to explain this component properly? Regression models may be used for many different purposes. And I will not agree that uh, in this case, uh, the main purpose of regression modeling is to explain effect of each variant. Again, I hope it's about variant, not variable. Uh, however people spell it, yeah? So in this case, it's not about explaining effect of each variant. It's about aggregating effect of many variants. It's first part. So I don't fully agree with the statement. And second, uh, in view of this statement, how should we interpret principal components? Is it? Uh, as I said, it's a covariate that allows to uh, minimize effect of population stratification. It's not relevant to the first statement, but principal components in regression model is a correction for hidden population stratification. All right. Thank you, Alexey, again. And thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ajay. Bye. Bye.